All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for, for joining us again. Uh, particular welcome to those of you that haven't dropped in on one of these webinars previously. We had a, uh, a pretty good week last week with uh, good attendance and some, some good presentations. So great to see a, a good group of people joining us again for these. We've got a bit of a special treat today. So these, um, these seminars uh, are run at 11 o'clock every day, just covering technical topics, as most of you know. Um, if you'd like to pop in and ask a question, you, you're just going to have to unmute yourself. Uh, by default, everyone's in on mute. And then just go ahead and ask a question. More than welcome to do so. There's also a chat box there uh, that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Just type a question if you'd like, um, either to myself or Bill directly, uh, otherwise to the entire group. Also, just to let you know that um, we'll be recording the meeting uh, today. Um, just so that everybody knows, and then they will be posted up on our website and also on YouTube later for viewing. Uh, I've noticed that's been a little bit popular actually, people ducking back and, and looking at those videos. Uh, and there you'll find also downloads of the presentation, uh, possibly also some TDSs and, and some brochures as well that might be of interest. So today, uh, the topic is HDPE corrosion protection liners. We've got uh, Bill Green from Bluey, who's joining us today to present on that. Bill's been with Bluey for more than uh, 10 years. Uh, he's a civil engineer, previously uh, 20 years experience in, uh, in precast concrete. He's our technical and specifications manager. So I might hand over to Bill and, um, and let him fire away with his, his presentation for the day, now that it seems that most of us uh, are on board and in the room. So go ahead, thanks Bill. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, welcome to uh, our presentation today. Um, Louis, um, as Daniel said, has been holding these webinars about various subjects, um, all um, relating to civil engineering applications um, in our industry. Uh, today's presentation uh, is about HDPE corrosion protection linings, uh, which is a, a fairly uh, topical subject uh, in the, particularly in the water industry. Uh, just to talk about the Australian experience with these types of products, um, water authorities around Australia have um, been using epoxies and other polymers to um, spray on and protect um, sewer assets in particular. Um, some of the precast companies in Australia have, have used PVC linings for um, casting linings, but predominantly the, um, most of the structures have been sprayed with, um, with polymer coatings. Now, these coatings have, have proven to be um, only a 10 or 20 year solution, and that really depends on how well it's applied and uh, the product that's applied. Um, as you would know, um, reapplication of any, any corrosion protection linings in a live sewer network uh, becomes very expensive and it disrupts the uh, network. <clears throat> now, water authorities are, are starting to recognise HDPE, CPL, as, as a one-off um, solution, and it's going to give you a 50 to 100 years um, lifetime or service life, depending on um, whether it's in the UV or, or, or an underground structure. Now, why do we need uh, concrete corrosion protection? Well, in, um, in sewage networks, the turbulence of the age sewage um, creates um, a gas called hydrogen disulfide. Um, now this gas uh, in the sewer Combines with uh, combined with oxygen and and water um, is consumed by a little organism that lives in the sewer called Theobacillus concretivorus. That little organism ex excretes sulfuric acid, and the sulfuric acid attacks uh, the Portland cement matrix of the concrete. Now this happens only above the low water lines because obviously below the water you don't have any oxygen for the organism to live. Now the loss of the cement matrix um, that of course, is what they call concrete corrosion, and um, concrete corrosion can ultimately uh, lead to a structure failure. Typically in a sewer or a con concrete pipe sewer, uh, they've seen where it's been um, either badly um, protected or not protected at all. You get uh, quite severe concrete corrosion above the low level water of the sewer. Now, uh, <clears throat> this, this is um, typical with where they, uh, protect these concrete pipes now is that they only go down to um, about 360, 350 degrees of the, of the pipe because the, the invert of the, um, the pipeline is obviously below the low water level and it doesn't suffer from the attack. 
Now, you'd ask why does spray applied linings fail? Well, there's, there's a multitude of reasons. Uh, you can see on the right there, the, uh, there's an old pump station that was about 20 years old, and you can see that the, the, the coating has quite, failed quite uh, significantly after 20 years. Uh, now, this is due to bad surface preparation or, or, or damp, damp issues in the structure when it was coated. Um, can be incorrect mixing of the products. Um, most polymers are a two or three part mix that have to be mixed on site. Uh, you can get pinholes in the coating um, because of the atmospheric conditions at the time of spraying. Um, live cracks in the structure fail the coating. This means that if the structure concrete cracks during its lifetime, the, the, the coatings are often not flexible enough to bridge the crack. And so you, you actually have a reflection crack uh, in the coating. Uh, groundwater from, from outside, now all concrete is uh, permeable so that if you've got any um, hydrostatic pressure from groundwater outside, it will migrate through the concrete and eventually cause uh, hydrostatic pressure behind the coating and cause it to delaminate. Um, dark or humid working environments Im impede the bond. Uh, most of those polymers are not very friendly against any moisture and don't, don't actually function that well if there is moisture present. Uh, there are curing difficulties and depending on what the structure and the atmosphere is like. And as I said, uh, concrete vapor transmission through the structure causes delamination. Now, conversely with a HDP liner, they, as I've said, they can last up to a hundred years, a uh, hundred years in a, in a non UV environment, which is most underground sewer structures. Uh, these, these linings are cast into the structural concrete. So they're ac actually part of the structure. Um, there's no on-site mixing of materials required. Um, pinhole free and defect free as they're made in the factory. There are set thickness in the, of the lining in the factory, so no one has to judge the thickness on site. And of course, HDPE has 700% elongation at, at break, so it can bridge across cracks between the knobs. Uh, welding of the seams is 100% quality tested. I'll talk about that further on in the presentation. Um, it can endure groundwater inflow because between the, uh, the anchors into the concrete, the, the membrane will, will part from the concrete and, and allow, allow fl flow of any hydrostatic pressure down to the base of the structure. Uh, there's no curing required. In other words, after it's cast into the concrete and you strip the forms, you weld the seams, uh, basically the, the structure can go into, um, into service. <clears throat> of course, it allows the vapor transmission. Some of the features that allow the uh, HDP CPL to last this 100 years, well, they use a virgin HDP resin. And these resins have extremely high uh, resistance to acids and other chemicals. Uh, they've got excellent abrasion resistance. Now, HDP is often used for slurry transfer in, in mining applications. This is um, preferred over steel because the HDP actually lasts longer in terms of abrasion. Um, the anchored membrane can release neg negative pressures. As I said, the uh, the, the flat piece between the anchors will actually um, not bond to the concrete. So this allows any pressure that comes through to release um, down to the bottom of the structure. Uh, light colors are, are stabilized with the UV stabilizer for two years sunlight. That's to cover the construction period. Um, structures exposed to sunlight are, are specified in black HDPE and these, this HDPE resin has combination of uh, carbon black stabiliser at two and a half percent. This allows up to 50 years service life, similar to uh, HDPE um, pipe in P100, P80. Um, there's been lots of testing done in with antioxidant depletion um, around the world on HDPE and they, they validate the 100 years life out of the sun, excuse me, out of the sun. Just to talk about the manufacture of HDP C CPL and how it's made. <clears throat> the companies that manufacture these type of products are um, manufactured under a certified um, quality system, an ISO 9001. Um, basically, the, the HDP comes in pallets, it's put into a hopper, um, it's pushed through the um, heated up to 200, above 200 degrees C, and then it's pushed through an extruder. Now the extruder feeds twin rollers and these rollers form a flat membrane with the anchors an integrally formed as part of the, um, out of the membrane. <clears throat> now sheet thickness can be manufactured from two millimeters up to 10 millimeters. 
and roll widths are usually from two to 3.2 meters. These um, plants have, have quite sophisticated laboratories that check a lot of the uh, attributes of the, of the product uh, to ASTM standards. Some of the things that they check during production are, are thickness, obviously it's within a, gotta be within a tolerance, uh, tensile strength, elongation, shrinkage, and of course the density defines the product in terms of its high density. Um, installation welding. Now, <clears throat> the, how the HDP functions, it's basically fastened to formwork on the flat side and the concrete is cast and cap capsulates around the, um, the anchors. Um, and up, various products have a number of anchors, but if you have 1,240 anchors per square meter, that, that gives you a, a 700 kPa pullout resistance of the anchors. Uh, the membrane has 13% elasticity and that, that, as I said, that allows the flat section of the membrane to stretch and allow transmission of moisture and pressure behind the, behind the lining and that, that alleviates any uh, pull out from over, over, over pressure from external um, groundwater. Um, that that uh, membrane has been tested to, to release from the concrete at around 50 kPa, which is quite a low pressure. Now all the seams are welded and 100% tested. Um, most of the site welding is done by an extrusion welder. Uh, you can see a picture of a, a modern um, extrusion welder there. They've come a long way in the last 30 odd years in this industry. Uh, they're now fully computer controlled to control the temp temperature accurately and the flow of um, molten um, extrudate. <clears throat> you can see here the welding wire is fed in through the side of the machine. It's usually four or five millimeter wire goes through an extruder that, um, sorry, it heats up to over 200 degrees C and then goes through an extruder, comes out through a Teflon shoe. Now, these Teflon shoes are uh, machined to various shapes, depending on whether you want to do an in internal, external corner weld or a standard um, flat weld. Um, these machines also have a preheating uh, mechanism. You can see there that it actually blows hot, hot air ahead of the Teflon shoe. That heats the sheet and actually prepares the uh, the sheet ahead of the weld so that it's um, at the same temperature. Very important with HDPE is that you actually remove the oxidization layer. This layer um, forms on the sheet pretty much in an hour after you, you take it off. So you need to uh, remove that layer and weld, apply the weld within, within half an hour. Um, applicators also chamfer edges of sheets and they also remove knobs where they overlap the sheet to do the welding. There's various details around for wells. Um, two of them shown here um, basically show where a sheet's joined on, on the formwork. Um, where you, where you do, the preferred, the preferred uh, detail is to overlap the sheet, as you can see on the right. On the left there, you have a maximum three millimeter uh, gap to the concrete. This is um, put in so that you don't actually lose too much heat out of the weld into the concrete because the concrete acts as a heat sink. There are various details for corners. You can see here external and internal corners. And um, again, you have the maximum three millimeter gap to um, allow, allow um, heat transfer from the weld. Um, <clears throat> if, if you've got more than three millimeters, you need to use a cover strip with two extrusion welds. There are um, various forms of welders. This is showing you a uh, extrusion welder on a, an automated orbital system for welding in concrete pipes. Uh, these are man entry sewer pipes and this machine was designed for repetitive welding of, of the CPL at the pipe joints. Um, it has a has an automatic pressure system so it actually applies a, a constant pressure as you go around the, the circumference of the pipe. <clears throat> butt welding is another way of joining the sheet. Uh, here you can see a butt welder set up making tubes to make uh, concrete pipes in a precast factory. Uh, basically it has a has an element in between the two ends of the sheet that heats up both ends to, to above 200 degrees C. The, uh, the ends of the sheets are forced together and that gives you a, an excellent weld in terms of butting together. Testing of welds, as I said, 100% of welds are tested after the membranes cast into the structure. Uh, this can be done by two ways, uh, either a vacuum box. Vacuum box is a uh, perspex box where you can apply a, a vacuum from a vacuum pump 
Uh, you paint the um, extrusion weld with a soapy water mix. You apply the vacuum to the box over the weld and you can see any imperfections where it'll bubble up through the, uh, through the weld and that can be repaired later on. Uh, the other alternative is to, to use an AC or DC spark tester. Uh, these, these testers um, apply a, a high voltage uh, current, sorry, a high voltage to the, uh, the weld that, that arcs through to a, um, a metal strip or wire under the weld or, or to a, the, the moist concrete under the, the lining. <clears throat> Some of the details that are available, you can see here penetration into the structure with a um, pipe. Uh, it's fairly common in sewer, sewer structures. Uh, with a non-HDP pipe, you use a fleece back HDP um, strip and that's epoxy to the non-HDP pipe around it. And then you, that leaves you two HDP surfaces you can extrusion well to. Alternatively, if you have PVC or ductile iron or stainless steel or steel, you can, uh, you, you can, sorry, you can use that, that system for uh, non-HDP such as PVC, uh, DICL or steel. Um, with uh, P100 or P80 pipes, you can weld straight from the membrane to those pipes. With corners, there's a couple of details where you've got a nice um, budding up of the membrane at a corner, you can use an internal corner extrusion weld. Alternatively, you can use a fabricated um, smooth um, cover strip that's bent into the corner with two extrusion welds. Where you've got tops of walls, uh, <clears throat> you can use the smooth fleece back HDPE, again, epoxy to the top of the wall. You bend over the, um, the HDPE and do two extrusion walls and welds on each side of the wall. Now fittings can be secured into the, into the uh, line structure anywhere you, that you uh, require, as long as it's not over an extrusion weld. Uh, the, the fittings are basically, you drill through the, uh, into the concrete with a hammer drill or a, or a coring drill, you, and you attach the fittings with a chemical anchor um, or expanding bolt. Um, the main thing there is to, to specify that either neoprene was, washes or, uh, or silicon around the bolt to make sure it's a gas type um, attachment. <coughs> Pipe joints, this is a typical pipe joint for a concrete pipe that's lined with a HDP CPL. Uh, generally, you can have a, an overlap with um, coming from the spigot to the socket, or alternatively, you can have a cover strip that is welded with two extrusion welds. The main thing about this type of system is that you have um, quality all the way from manufacture through to installation. Um, I talked about the quality systems in the manufacture. Now, when you come to design and planning, there are international codes around that, that specify the, the various installation details and how you plan to uh, line a structure. Um, all uh, manufacturers of C HDB CPLs have installation manuals that their applicators um, work to. And there's, there's a need for a sheet layout plans for each structure so that you actually carefully plan where your welds are and where you're going to cut the sheet and which details you're going to use for penetrations, etc. <clears throat> One of the important things is not to, um, to plan to, to tank a structure. Um, although you, you will have up to 700 kPa pullout on the membrane, um, the long term, term pullout is, is restricted due to uh, creep of HDPE. So most of these products will, will have a maximum of 200 kPa long-term capacity of the anchors. So the key is to, um, to make sure that you don't get anywhere near that um, type of, of pressure, negative pressure on the membrane. And the way to do that is to design in pressure release um, mechanisms combined with the drainage behind the, behind the membrane. <coughs> The other most important part is to make sure that your applicators are well-trained and are competent. Um, approved applicators, companies sh should only be used. In other words, people that are, that are, that are approved by the, by the CPL supplier. Um, the people that work for these uh, companies should have formal training in, in uh, welding of um, HDP CPL. And of course, the, the most important part is that the CPL supplier provides all the relevant technical support to the product. Uh, the product can be uh, post-installed or, or used to remediate structures. So the way that this is done is through grouting. Now, 
uh, unlike uh, polymers such as epoxies and uh, polyurea, cement grouts are very tolerant of damp structures. So you can actually grout these to a damp, damp surface and still get excellent bond. Um, can be applied to floors and benches in the new structures in this manner. Um, and then of course, remediation of old structures as possible by grouting the lining. Um, any structure shapes could be remediated. Um, of course, you have to have a formwork that's designed to hold the line and resist the hydrostatic loads. Um, could, depending on the access to the structure, you need to have a, a very simple assembly that can be put into the manhole, cast the lining and removed. Surface prep is key, as in any um, bonded um, membrane. Uh, the surface preparation should be uh, minimum minimum roughness of CSP5, and it's important to have it very clean and, and clear of any uh, loose, loose particles or dust. So dust is the enemy of bond. Um, a lot of specifiers uh, nominate that you actually test the bond on the structure before grout, grouting the liner in. So you, you build a test pad out of the grout onto the side of the structure after it's clean. Um, you need to have a, a bond of that grout it's in excess of any um, possible hydrostatic pressure from the outside. And often this, this bond is not, not a function of the grout itself, but it usually uh, the maximum tensile strike you can get from the substrate. <clears throat> grout specifications. Uh, you need to have a grout that's very high fluidity, obviously, because it needs to go in behind the membrane down to 12 millimeter gap and up to a hundred millimeter gap. It needs to be a low water, water cement ratio that obviously gives you high compression strength and high chemical bond. Um, you can get bond up to two, two MPA, um, which is 2000 KPA. A couple of photos of a rehabilitated pump station um, using HDP CPL. Uh, you can see a, a view from up from the bottom and down from the top. So had quite a neat um, finish. And also you're looking at a, a one-off rehabilitation, that structure's net lifetime now is, with respect to corrosion is, is increased to 100 years. Just to give you an idea of how this product is used, these products are used around the world. I'll give you some uh, examples of typical installations. These are sewer manholes. You can see one on the left is a trunk sewer. One on the right is a, uh, a residential sewer manhole. Uh, sewer pump stations, um, these Photos of a pump station, I think, up to about six metres diameter. <clears throat> concrete sewer pipes. Um, concrete sewer pipes have been done around the world uh, now with HDPE and on numerous projects, particularly the lateral sewers on the deep tunnel projects in Singapore, Middle East and Africa. Uh, wastewater treatment plants. You can see uh, some quite complex shapes can be done with the, the lining, uh, providing you do the uh, the layout plans and, and planning. Uh, this is a, a bioreactor tank where the, uh, obviously it's a semispherical surface which uh, can be lined with the lining. <coughs> Numerous tunnels around the world have been lined with, um, with AKS and other products. Uh, you can see on the left there, they, they're wrapping the lining around a, a traveling uh, mold. That mold goes through a already completed segmental tunnel and they concrete the lining in into the tunnel as a second pass lining. Several projects now have done bit with a single pass. In other words, they, they line the um, segment, segments themselves in the precast factory with the, with the HDP CPL. See in the, in the center there, it's about a 3.2 meter diameter tunnel with the trial rings for the, for the tunnel. And, and then on the right hand side, you can see that where they welded all of the, um, the joints of the segment in the tunnel. A lot of these deep tunnels, sewers also have access shafts that have to be lined. This particular one is in the Middle East. I think it was up to um, 60 or 70 metres deep. Very important to um, specify how that's going to be drained because obviously you have in 70 metres, you have quite a lot of groundwater pressure. So some of the detailing there is very important to make sure that the, the water pressure is released down to the bottom of the sewer. Uh, sewer structures, you can see that some quite quite uh, complicated structures have been um, lined with HDPE. Um, these are edits you know, on a deep tunnel sewer in the Middle East. The other application is, is in the mining sector and the, the chemical industry. Uh, these are photos of a 
of a project in Congo in, in Africa where they actually lined uh, uh, sulfuric acid buns uh, for a copper mine. Um, the feature here is that the, the CPL actually has a, uh, a knob surface on the top side as well. So it's grouted onto the, onto the bund with grout. And then on the top side, you have a non-slip surface allows pedestrian traffic. Just to summarize a few of the key points I've talked about, it's a, it's a one time uh, solution, 100 year service life, uh, very high chemical and abrasion resistance. Uh, it's easily cast into new structures and it's suitable for re rehabilitation of old structures. Uh, the product's quality control right from manufacture through to installation and it, it's the lowest whole of life cost. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Bill. Uh, appreciate that. Good, good little presentation there. Just wondering if we've got any any questions that anyone on the webinar might have for Bill. You can either type it into the chat box or otherwise feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. I'm sure Bill will be more than happy to answer it. If you um, don't want to ask it here, you can always shoot us an email. Just send it through to bluey at bluey.com.au and, um, and we can answer any questions for you. Like I said, the um, a video of the presentation will be up on our website later today and there'll also be some downloads uh, available there. Um, doesn't look like we have any any questions at this stage. Uh, just remind you all that 11 o'clock every, every day, uh, we do have a question coming in from Jerry. Um, so Bill, Jerry wants to know how long is the typical rehab installation process, say for a normal manhole of six metres deep? Um, that's a good question, Jerry. Um, it depends, depends obviously on the complexity of the structure and also access. Um, if, if you're doing um, a structure that needs traffic control, of course, it's, um, it's a much more um, involved process. But if they're doing one in a, um, in a property where you have good access, um, it's, it's usually, a, it can be a week's, up to a week's um, process. Obviously, you've got to um, do your, your grout bond test You've got to set up your formwork, pour the grout. You've got to um, wait 24 hours before you can strip the formwork. And um, then you've, uh, you've got to go back and um, weld and test all the, all the wells. But it re really would um, depend on, on the, the size of the structure, but a six meter manhole, I think they would, they would do it easily in, within a week. Got another question here from Shane. Uh, can he, uh, liner be used for internal wall protection of concrete anaerobic digester tanks with an agitation system? Uh, yes, yes, I think it probably has been used for that, providing that, that none of the um, the paddles or blades that are agitating don't don't contact the surface. Um, as as I said in the in the um, presentation, the, the product has a very um, high abrasion resistance. But you may you may look at um, specifying a, a slightly thicker membrane. Now, a lot of the um, the sewage structures that are lined in Australia and around the world are around about two and a half mil. So in a, in a um, in a structure where you've got movement of grit and so forth, uh, you may look at going for maybe a five mil liner. Five mil is in uh, five millimeters, just for the uh, guys who are on from the US. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Really appreciate your time, and I hope this has provided a nice little break for you um, outside of the isolation and other challenging work conditions that we're all faced with at the moment. And uh, I hope you can join us again uh, tomorrow and, um, and some other days this week. So thank you. I'll, um, I'll end the meeting now.